guitar roofs off and back out, and then I missed the piano playing, but well, what a powerful, y'all did a good job singing those hymns now, I'm going to tell you what, I was impressed, you can just sense the presence of the Lord, and your harmonies are so beautiful, and of course, our choir, that's a beautiful song, that song never gets old, Mercy Tree, when you think about that, we got a lot to be thankful for, I like the old hymn, we are so blessed, we are blessed in so many ways, we're blessed above and beyond what we can think or ask many times that we just don't take time to say, Lord, just thank you. Thank you not only for saving my soul and making me whole, but thank you, Lord, just for your blessings. A lot of time, blessings unseen that we don't realize the Lord blesses us with above and beyond. And um, we got a lot, like I said, a lot to be thankful for. And I'm thankful for each of you, and I appreciate you being here today. And so I want you to go ahead and take your Bible and get ready. Uh, let's go to Psalm 23 on seeing Jesus in the Psalms. I'll be speaking today on the power of his presence as we see Jesus being our good, our great, and our mighty chief shepherd. And so we want to read one of the, a very familiar, probably one of the dearest passages in the Psalms. And I'm sure most of you have read it, heard it many times of your lifetime, and you may even know this one by heart. But let's read it. And we'll follow the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word with prayer. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, Lord, I ask again, Lord, for that which I do not deserve and definitely cannot buy. Father, I ask for that fresh touch and fresh anointing. That I'll decrease, that you increase, O oh God, and you empower me to preach this message today that is very clear, very understandable to everyone under the sound of my voice. And Father, we pray, O oh God, that through this service today, that someone's heart will be touched. And Father, that I have even a, a greater love and a greater appreciation for you and your role as our good, our great, and our chief shepherd. And we can't thank you enough for what you provide for us. So we're looking forward to what you have planned as we ask you to bind the devil and all the demon spirits that may try to cause distractions. We know the devil does not want this message preached, Lord, but we're not, it's not about him, it's all about you. And we just want you to be high and lifted up and your will to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this beautiful psalm is a about God and his people. And the psalm speaks of joys and fears of human beings and reminds us that our Lord is a caring, compassionate God. This psalm also reminds us that we as God's people are like sheep. And just as sheep depend on their shepherd for care, protection, and provision, we as God's sheep also must depend on God's care, protection, and provision every day of our life. So there's no doubt who the shepherd is that the psalmist is writing about in Psalm 23 because David makes it very clear when he says, The Lord is my shepherd. And Jesus said about himself in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ is the great shepherd. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, we read that Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. So in the Bible, we clearly see Jesus is the good shepherd, he's the great shepherd, and he's the chief shepherd. In fact, in Psalm 22, just before this psalm, David presents Jesus as the good shepherd as he talks about his death by the crucifixion on the cross way before it ever happened. In Psalm 24, he speaks of Jesus as a chief shepherd who will someday come back for his sheep, which we know is going to happen. But right here in this psalm, he speaks of Jesus being the great shepherd, the great personal shepherd, and he's the shepherd who lives right now, this very moment, to care, guide, protect, and provide for his sheep. So I want you to see right from the Word of God this morning why we consider Jesus Christ to be the great and mighty good shepherd that he is and always will be. First of all, Jesus is the great shepherd because Jesus saves. 
Jesus saves. We love that hymn. Jesus saves, and it's because he does. And, he, and because he saves is why you and I have hope for tomorrow. The Bible says in verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When he says the Lord, that means the one who was, who is, and who always will be the one and only Lord God Almighty. Jesus referred to this title when he said in John 8, verse 58, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus told us, I am the Alpha and the Omega, that is the beginning and the end. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. And what Jesus was saying is, I am the beginning, I am the end, I'm everything in between, for I always was, I am right now, and I always will be God. And so what we see here in this statement is when he says the Lord is my shepherd, that's the fact that Jesus does save because this statement reflects of a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who is the good, the great, and the chief shepherd. And that's so important because a lot of people think about religion, but religion can't save anybody. It is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what separates Christianity from all the other religions in the world. Notice David doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He says the Lord is my shepherd. That's, again, reemphasizing the personal relationship. And being a born-again Christian is a matter of that personal relationship with the one and only Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you know if you're one of the Lord's sheep? Well, over in John chapter 10, Jesus says, my sheep know me. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see, a true believer is one who knows the Lord in a personal way and has a heart's desire to want to follow the Lord in obedience. Not because you have to, but because you want to. The more you love God, the more you really want to obey Him. It just works that way. And so a person like that can say with confidence, the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal shepherd. This is a person who will hear the voice of Jesus speaking through his word. When we pray, we talk to God. When we read and listen to his word, God speaks to us. God's word reaches down to the deepest part of our heart and soul. And a saved person is given a new set of appetites, a new set of spiritual senses without heart's desire to want to follow and obey the Lord. And so a true Christian is a person who does follow the Lord as a disciple, that who is basically ever becoming and never arriving in your spiritual walk because we'll never reach full spiritual maturity on this side of heaven. we always got room to grow in our Christian walk. I've been saved since I was eight years old, and I'm still learning, I'm still growing in the Lord, and that growth will continue until we get to heaven. You see, once we're saved, we've been justified. Then we're being sanctified. That's the process of spiritual growth from the day you get saved until you get to heaven where you'll be glorified. And according to Romans chapter 8, that's a done deal in God's eyes. So once we're, being, once we're saved, we're being sanctified in Christ. And the Bible teaches we're going to follow our shepherd. We will recognize his voice. Now in the ancient times, when the shepherd would approach a village with his sheep, they would put their sheep in a common sheepfold uh, with other sheep, with other shepherds. And, but it was just one great big pen. But it was said that the shepherd spent so much time with his own sheep and became so intimately involved with his sheep that the sheep would recognize the voice of their own personal shepherd. They didn't recognize the voice of the other shepherds that were not their personal shepherd. So when the shepherd would walk up, go to the sheepfold, go right through the gate, the shepherd would speak, the sheep would hear the voice of their shepherd, and one by one, they would begin to come out of the sheepfold and follow their shepherd. And that is a picture of a real Christian. And we know, because we know the voice of the good and the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, because once we know him, we had that personal relationship with him, and we know that still small voice will recognize it every time. One day, Jesus Christ, the great shepherd, stood in the cemetery, and he didn't say, come forward publicly, generically. He didn't give a general, wide-open invitation for just anybody to come forth, because if Jesus would have done that, every person in that cemetery would have come out to the grave. But he said very specifically, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus recognized the voice of his personal shepherd, and he came out of that tomb alive. And one of these days... 
At a time only God knows, the shepherd of our soul, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to descend from heavens, and the Bible says there's going to be a shout, and the Lord's going to speak the words that Revelation chapter 4 tells us, come up here. And when that happens, those, of, uh, those who have died in Christ will rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And all that's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye. All because the sheep of the Lord know his voice, will recognize and hear him when he says, come up here. And praise God when that happens. And so the Bible teaches Jesus saves us. That makes us his sheep. And that's why I say the Lord is my great and my mighty good shepherd because the Lord has saved my soul. But I want to give you another reason why the Lord Jesus Christ is our great shepherd. That is because, number two, Jesus guides. He guides. Look at verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now, today, as you well know, we live in a world that can make us restless. A lot of uncertainties all around us every day. There's a flurry of things that can cause us to be restless, uneasy, stressed, and all that affects your ability to rest. But I find it interesting, the psalmist says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. In other words, the Lord has a way of just grabbing hold of us and, and basically say, sit down and calm down. In other words, the Lord can even lay us down at times uh, so that we're forced to look up. Sometimes, sometimes people have to learn the hard way. But I'm glad that we got a shepherd like that who desires for us to get rest and desires for us to really take that time and to really put our focus on him. I need a shepherd who loves me enough to lead me, to care for me, and to provide me rest when I need it. And the scripture says he leads us. That means he guides us. The Bible says beside the still waters, that means quiet waters where there's peace. Notice again how the psalm starts. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means I shall not lack. That means my Lord will meet my deepest needs. That shows us the abundance that our Lord provides for us in verse 2 when he makes me lie down in green pastures. In other words, God is going to provide everything we need and he makes you and me free to rest. Now, see, sheep will not rest unless they're free from conflicts with other sheep. They're free from threats, from the predators and the pests and the hunger that they would experience. So the shepherd must protect the sheep from the problems on the outside as well as the inside. And so the shepherd had to find a good feeding grounds where the sheep could eat and rest safely and properly. You see, there were some things that had to take place in the life of a fold of sheep if they're going to be delivered from their restlessness. And just the very presence of their shepherd, caring for them, guarding, protecting, and providing for them, gave the sheep calmness to eat and to rest in peace. Well, aren't you so glad that Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, when he gave the great commission, also told us this promise, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Aren't you glad our Lord promises us that I will never leave you nor forsake you? All the stuff that's around us on any given day that can cause us to panic, that can cause us to get nervous. The Bible doesn't say anywhere that he will remove all that. But the Bible says in the midst of all that turbulence, in the midst of all the trials and tribulations that we're going to have to face on this earth, he'll stand with us and he'll guide us through the green pastures and lead us beside the still waters. Jesus told us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And so sheep have to be free from fear. They have to be free from friction. That's why sheep need a shepherd. You know, sheep sometimes will butt heads with each other. And so the shepherd would have to separate them to maintain order and to allow the, the sheep to rest and, and, and feed in peace. So it's no wonder that God chose sheep to describe the people of God. Because sadly, even in some local churches, God's people sometimes butt heads with each other. And thank God we don't have a big problem with that here, but we all have to keep our guard up so it don't become a problem. The great shepherd's presence, though, puts an end to that rivalry it, and that desire to butt heads. And when we as God's sheep desire to follow his voice, then we know that he desires that we promote harmony and, and unity and the bond of peace and not division or discord. Well, I don't know what that is, but it's not the rapture because we're still here. So, all right. <laughs> all right. 
So in a sheepfold, when sheep are focusing their attention and the affection in the shepherd, they don't fuss and fight. And when God's people put their attention and affection on the great shepherd, who is the head of the church, then they don't fuss and fight either. Because how do we have unity in the body of Christ when there's so much diversity in the body of Christ? I mean, we all have different likes and dislikes. We all have different DNA. We all have different gifts and talents. We have different strengths and weaknesses. So how do you have unity in a church body with so much diversity? Well, by each of us doing our part to put our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, loving God first and foremost with all our heart, with all our mind and all our strength. You see, when our vertical relationship with God is right, then, then you're in a great position for your horizontal relationships with all others to be right. If I'm in tune with Jesus and you're in tune with Jesus, then we are all in tune with Jesus. That means we're in tune with one another. And by that, we can work together to edify and encourage the body of Christ instead of dividing and discouraging the church body. But the presence of the shepherd helps to deliver sheep from fear, friction, restlessness, and even hunger. You see, if sheep are very hungry, they can't settle down. So I wonder sometimes if that's why some of God's people are so restless and irritable, because they're spiritually hungry. You see, the spiritual, the, the green pastures here pictures the, the Word of God. That's, that is our, our spiritual food. And the still, uh, quiet waters pictures the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and He feeds the soul of a Christian. But today we have a lot of believers that are nervous and anxious and controlled by their circumstances. And they always seem to be in a state of panic. Their souls are starving. And the reason for that, they're not feeding on the Word of God on a regular basis. So therefore, they're not growing as a Christian. You can't grow if you don't feed on the Word of God. So listen to me this morning. When you allow the Holy Spirit of God to take the Word of God to speak to your soul, your soul that's been saved by His grace through faith, I want you to know the great and mighty shepherd will manifest His presence in your situation. He'll give you calmness in the midst of whatever storm you're going through because when you have peace with God, then you can experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And so I say the Lord Jesus is a great shepherd because Jesus saves. I say he's a great shepherd because Jesus guides. But he's also a great shepherd because Jesus restores. He restores, look at verse 3, he restores my soul. This is a matter of the heart and spirit here. He restores my soul and leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's a great promise from God. This ought to encourage every single one of you here today as a believer. Because even believers sometimes make wrong choices. Every Christian sometimes, if we don't keep our guard up, we can make wrong choices. And sometimes even God's people who should know better, but it happens, get off the right path and they get on the wrong path for a season. They get over there on the ditch of despair or disaster just from making wrong choices. And remember, there's always consequences to bad choices. The Bible's clear. You reap what you sow. And there's plenty of tempting parking places on your way to God's best for your life. The devil don't want God's best for you, so he's going to try to distract you. He's going to try to set some landmines and detours. The devil wants to pull you off the side of the road. And the devil knows exactly where to tempt you in your weakest area. That's why the Bible says, make no provision for the flesh to stumble. Because if you willingly tempt yourself to sin, then you're going to sin. Our flesh is just absolutely too weak to say no to that which appeals to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. If you tempt yourself, you will lose. A few years ago, there was a very uh, famous Christian singer with a very popular group who were at the top of their game. I mean, many big hits, many prestigious awards. And this particular man in the group had an a, a incredible voice, but he let his guard down. And he got into some trouble, and it cost his marriage. And for a long time, he was not seen or heard in ministry anywhere. And then after a long time, he began to sing again with the same group that he was once with. And when it came time to share his testimony, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard for you, me to explain to y'all what all happened to me. I'm not happy about it. I, I, I'm sorry, and I regret it. All I can just tell you is, while I was on my way, I lost my way. And I never forgot that. He said, I lost my way. That didn't mean he lost his salvation. He lost his way as a Christian. 
Well, what causes a Christian to lose their way? Well, sometimes it's just sin. And the devil knows how to bait the hook. The devil knows how to make that bait very attractive. When the devil sets a trap, he camouflages it so you don't see the darkness and the danger of sin involved. Remember, the Bible even says sin can be pleasurable for a season, but that season will end. And the devil doesn't let you see what happens after that season. The regret, the pain, the, just the, the sorrowness. The scripture even tells us the devil even will appear to us as an angel of light, enticing us to sin. And that sin will drive a wedge between us from God. And when that happens, we need restoration. We need the Lord to restore our soul. Well, let me tell you something else that can cause Christians to lose our way, and that is neglect. Oftentimes, Christians who should know better neglect the things that God teaches us to do. Like neglecting the reading and the hearing of the Word of God. Neglecting to be faithful in the house of God on the Lord's day when the Bible is so clear not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Listen, I need to be here this week, each week. Unless it's an emergency, unless there's sickness, unless there's something that's beyond our control at times, I need to be here, not because I'm your pastor, but because I need, as a Christian, this time of public worship. I need to be with God's people. I need the inspiration. I need the booster shot. I need to have my batteries recharged. I, I can't live the victorious Christian life away from the body of Christ. The Christian life was never designed to live in isolation. God did not call you or save you to be a Lone Ranger Christian. God desires you to be part of the body of Christ, to be part of the church. But oftentimes, people neglect the very thing that God teaches us to do. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, How shall we neglect if we neglect so great a salvation? Neglect the great salvation. Neglect the great Savior. Neglect the great Shepherd. Now listen, that verse is not an evangelistic verse. When you read Hebrews 2 in its context, it's talking to believers. How shall we escape defeat? How shall we escape uh, being overcome by temptation? How can we escape uh, depression, anxiety? How shall we escape meteorocracy or faithlessness or unbelief? How can we escape all those things if we neglect our own salvation by not doing what saved born-again Christians are supposed to be doing? And so I have to worship corporately. I have to be under the Word of God. I have to seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God daily. I have to spend time with God in prayer daily, not just once a week, but every day, not just for sermon preparation, but my own personal time with God. Because if I neglect my inner man, I can lose my way. And if that happens, I need the Lord to restore my soul. But another way we lose our way is through deception. And the Bible teaches us here there, that there is the shepherd and then there are some false shepherds out there. Jesus told us in Matthew 7 that you need to be careful and look out, beware of false prophets, those that are wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. Basically, Jesus warned, beware of preachers and teachers that come to you dressed like a true shepherd. They may try to talk like a true shepherd, but what's coming out of their mouth is a lie. That's why the Bible tells us to test the spirits. How do you test the spirits? You test it with the truth from the Word of God. I heard a testimony many years ago from a fellow that attended a very large mainline Protestant church right here in America. And he got under conviction during the service and felt that he was lost. So he went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I don't, I don't believe I'm saved. So what I need to do? And the pastor said, man, you're a good boy. Just do the best you can and you'll make it. The man said, well, that ain't right. So he went to another church, and the church actually gave an altar call during the invitation, which sadly, that's phasing out in many places today. But he went down and told uh, one of the counselors, the helping the pastor, he said, look, I, I, I believe I need to get saved. And that pastor said, oh, no, what you need to do is get baptized with the Holy Ghost, and once you start speaking in tongues, that's evidence that you're saved. He said, well, that sounds like that's getting the cart before the horse. Because I didn't ask for some sign speaking gift. I, I'm, I'm seeking salvation for my soul. So he finally went home and he grabbed his Bible and, he, and, he, and he, he basically took his own self through the Romans road. And he, and he accepted just a simple gospel of Christ's death, his burial, 
and resurrection. So you think about that now. The first pastor said, you're okay, do the best you can and you'll make it. Well, we know that's wrong because none of us could make it that way. There's no goodness in any of us apart from Christ. If we could be good enough, Jesus wouldn't have had to die for us. And then when it comes to speaking in tongues to prove that you're saved, that's not taught anywhere in the Bible. In fact, Paul said that's the least of all gifts. So you have to be aware of those things that adds, takes away, or contradicts what the Bible teaches. Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. And so if any so-called evangelist, preacher, apostle, prophet tells you something that God has revealed to them, but God didn't reveal it to Moses, God didn't reveal it to the prophets, God didn't reveal it to the apostles who God inspired to write our Bible, run away from them as fast as you can. Because it's not in this Word of God. It's not the Word of God. Understand that. Go back to your Bible. Anybody that tells you anything that takes away, adds to, or distorts is a false shepherd. And sometimes, if you're not careful, false teachers know just enough of the truth to try to trick you, get you off track. And if that happens to you, you need the Lord to restore your soul. But sometimes you need restoration just because of fatigue. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. And it could be a combination of those where you just, you need a fresh touch from God. You know, when you're serving the Lord, preaching, teaching, serving faithfully, using your spiritual gifts for the Lord, front lines, behind the scenes, praying, witnessing, parenting at home, your daily job, just intensely trying to live for Jesus and all that you do inside and outside the walls of the church, you can get tired even doing the Lord's work. It can get exhausting. Remember one day a, a woman snuck up on Jesus and just touched the hem of his garment. We preached about that a few weeks ago. And Jesus felt something come out of him, which we know that was his healing power. But there's another principle illustrated there. Because when you serve the Lord faithfully, when you witness, when you're involved in intercessory prayer, when you're teaching, when you're sharing, when you're seeking to live the Christ-like life, sometimes physically, emotionally, and even spiritually, it takes something out of you. And when that happens, you need spiritual revival. You see, spiritual renewal is not just for those who've fallen out in deep sin. It's also for God's people who are preaching and teaching and serving and singing, interceding, loving, giving, just doing everything they can for the glory and honor of God. Just remember, if you continue to give it out, but you don't take the time to replenish and take it in, you can burn out. Sometimes you have to open your soul to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I just need a fresh touch from heaven. I need you to restore my soul. And let me tell you what happens when you do that. Because you can know that you've been restored when the Lord has put you right back on the right path, right back in that fresh touch. The Bible says in verse 3, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. So I say... Jesus is a great shepherd because Jesus saves. Jesus is a great shepherd because Jesus guides. Jesus is a great shepherd because he restores. But also, Jesus is a great shepherd because he comforts. He comforts. Oh, what a verse I'm fixing to read. What hope this passage is going to give somebody who may be sitting here today, somebody who may watch this online at some appointed time. One of the most precious verses in all the Bible, Psalm 4 and verse 4. And this one, it says, Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I'll fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's a very comforting promise. You see, this scripture teaches us Jesus took death and made it into a doorway. You see, a valley has an entrance, but it also has an exit. And there are a lot of valleys that we may have to walk through in life, but probably the most darkest and difficult valley is the threat of death for you. Or someone you love. That's the darkest valley you have to face. Sometimes your valley may be what you're going through in your marriage or with your children. And that can include your grown children or maybe your, your grandchildren. Could be your job. It could be some type of financial stress. I may not know what valley you're in right now or what you're fixing to head into, but the Bible teaches us the valley of the shadow of death, which is the worst valley you can go through because the Bible teaches us death is the last enemy. It's the greatest threat and can cause the greatest fear that we may face. But we don't have to live in fear of anything, including death. In fact, we're not supposed to be in fear. 
Because the Bible says God's not given us a spirit of fear. And so if you're afraid of anything, including death, that fear came from the devil, not from God. The spirit of a Christian is supposed to have a sound mind and to be filled with the love of the Lord. We're to have that sound mind and sweet spirit so that we don't have a sour spirit or a troubled mind. Many people today are afraid and they live in constant fear and they're always thinking the worst could happen. And Satan uses that tight fear to rob you of your joy and peace that you should have in the Lord. So I want you to understand this morning, right from this verse, the Lord, our great shepherd, he can deliver you from all your fears. I want you to know the Red Sea couldn't stop Moses. The walls of Jericho couldn't stop Joshua. The giant Goliath could not stop David. And death on the cross could not stop Jesus Christ. Yes, he was crucified. He died on that cross. Yes, he was buried in that barred tomb. But on day three, up from the grave, he arose. Praise God. He is, he is alive. He'll always be alive. And Jesus basically says, look, I have been there. I have walked through that valley. I have conquered victory over it. And in me, you can conquer it too. Because we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, is telling us, I'll take you by the hand. I'll lead you every step of the way. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so this is why he calls this the shadow of death. Because technically, you know, Christians don't really die. We have eternal life. The moment of our physical death, we just change addresses. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. So it, death's not a sting for us. Because we have eternal life. So that means death is just a shadow. And shadows can't hurt you. The Bible says to die in Christ is to gain, to profit for all eternity. The shadow of a gun can't shoot you. The shadow of a knife can't cut you. The shadow of fire can't burn you. And the shadow of death cannot kill you. So I want you to know, when you think about Job and the valley he walked through, and when he looked back, he saw the fingerprints of God on all the trials that he faced. Because, see, many times God will use the valleys that we have to go through to build and strengthen our faith and teach us lessons that we would not learn any other way. When I went through my cancer five years ago, I learned things that I would not have learned had I not had to go through that. The fact is, all of us are either coming out of a valley, we're fixing, we may be in one right now, are we fixing to head into it? That's just part of life on this earth. And the valley that you're walking in right now or maybe heading into, I want you to remember this. God is going to use that to build a faith in you that you never had, a courage in you that you never had, a strength in you that you never had, a hope in you that you never had, and maybe even a ministry that you thought you never have. So don't ever look at a valley as your enemy because I want you to know when you go through the valley, on the other side, there's a blessing that God has waiting for you. And I want you to know the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. And Jesus would not ever send you into any valley alone. But he walks with you in it and through the valley. Did you see that? Yea, though I walk. He didn't say sit down. He didn't say, though I lose my way, can't find my way out. You might want to underline this in your Bible. Yea, though I walk through the valley. That means you're going to get through it. You're not going to stay in it. You're going to get through the crisis. You're going to get through the, the tunnel, so to speak. There is light at the end. That's what this verse teaches. So hallelujah. We get great comfort and encouragement from the great shepherd with this great promise. Aren't you glad when he gave us to that great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel? When he throwed that promise, as I said earlier, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Aren't you glad he promises that he'll never leave you nor forsake you? You have to remind yourself of that when you're facing the difficult days in life. Aren't you glad that the Bible says all the promises, not just some of them, all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. So I want you to know whatever you're going through, You'll never be by yourself. You're never alone. The great shepherd always sits close to the sheep. He never abandons the sheep, no matter how deep, how dark, how dangerous the valley is. And so I say Jesus is the great shepherd because Jesus saves. 
He's the great shepherd because he guides. He's the great shepherd because he restores. He's the great shepherd because he comforts. But also he's the great shepherd because he supplies. He supplies. Look at verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. In other words, God will provide for our hunger, even when we're surrounded by enemies. And we can be confident that our God will take care of our needs, even if we're hated or we're in danger. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he'll keep us away from enemies, because we know we got enemies to face every day. We all have enemies. We all have trials and difficulties. That's just a fact of life on this earth. In the Old Testament, when the children of Israel, they had enemies that always surrounded them. But every morning, first thing on the do, God put fresh manna to feed them on the ground. That entire group of enemies that surrounded them had to watch God bless them in the wilderness with a miracle every single day. The psalmist said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of of my enemies. Let me tell you, we have the world, we have the flesh, we have the devil. That's our three main enemies that we all face every single day. And there's enemies out there. There's unbelievers that may mock us and curse us and even try to persecute us. But this is what God says. I'm not going to remove you from the mystery enemies, but I'm going to load your table down with blessings. And so your enemies are going to have to watch you feast on what faith in me has brought to your table. Now we know the greatest enemy, of course, is sin. But our Lord, our great shepherd, he's going to, he, he, he basically said, he has set a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And one day when Jesus was sitting at a table with his disciples, he said, men, you see that bread? That bread represents my body that's going to be nailed to a cross. And you see that cup there? That cup represents my blood. And my blood is going to be shed on that cross for total forgiveness for all your sin. That's what it's going to take for me to solve the sin problem that you have, to deliver you, to totally forgive you. I'm going to be your substitute. My body's going to be nailed to a cross. My blood is going to be shed. And out of that one-time all-sufficient sacrifice is going to come the blessing of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So I want you to know, folks, on that hill called Calvary, there was a table. The holy God was setting for us. And in the midst of the Lord's enemies, he died. He shed his blood. The Bible says, by his stripes, our souls are healed. But look what else the scripture says. Jesus, our great shepherd, he supplies because, see, he's our source of supply to meet any need we have. Because not only does he save us, but he keeps us saved. He said he anoints our head with oil. That is a picture of God taking care of our bodily needs as well as our spiritual needs. This is, a, this is a double whammy here. You see, our great shepherd is also known as the great physician who has power to heal any sickness or disease. Now, for the shepherd and the sheep in those days, they would have flying insects that would just plague the sheep in the summer months. Well, oil was a natural bug repellent. It also had a natural healing medicine that would smooth and bring relief to irritated skin. But also oil in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And when he says he anoints our head with oil, that holy anointing in the Bible is pictured as the Holy Spirit anointing who comforts us and provides for us our source of peace. Well, those sheep, as the shepherd would watch over them, they had all kinds of problems, especially with nasal flies. And those nasal flies would get up there in their nostrils and drive those sheep crazy. I mean, those sheep would butt their heads against a tree trying to get rid of those pesty things. It would drive them nuts. It wouldn't kill them, but it would drive them nuts. And today we live in a world, we got to deal with a lot of aggravations, a lot of pests out there. They're not going to kill us, but they can definitely drive us nuts. Now, physically speaking, you know, we're in the low country. We got gnats, we got mosquitoes. We got yellow flies. They can put a knot on you. Those pesty things are not going to kill you unless you have a serious allergic reaction. But they can definitely drive you nuts. They can definitely be uncomfortable, especially those no seams. But when he says you anoint my head with oil, there was an oil that the shepherd would anoint the face and the nostrils of the sheep, and it kept those pests out. And you as a born-again Christian, you have the Holy Spirit oil. It's the Holy Spirit in the midst of pestering situations that continues to give you peace. 
Even in the midst of aggravating times, the Holy Spirit in us can still manifest the fruit of love, joy, and peace. And that's the difference between someone saved and someone's not. But you know what else the shepherd would have to do for those oil? With that oil for the sheep's head? See, sheep, remember I told you they had a habit of butting heads with each other? When he would anoint their head with oil, when they would run to butt each other, that oil, they would glance off. It was like trying to catch a greased pig. It, was, it made them very slippery. So let me tell you, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're overflowing with the oil of the Holy Spirit, the pest, the smart aleck, the aggravations, the irritations that you may have to face will be like water off a duck's back. I'm telling you, at a glance off of you, you'll keep yourself focused. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your feelings are not going to be on your sleeve. You will not have a chip on your shoulder. You'll be able to exercise self-control so that you don't allow your emotions to get you out of control when you're anointed by the oil of the Holy Spirit. And that's in you. The moment you get saved and it helps cause that other stuff, that we have to face in life, the past, the aggravating things in life to fade away so it don't rob your peace with God. That's why it's so important for every believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. So notice else in the verse, he said, my cup runs over. That's a cup of blessing. You see, my provision from God is always abundant. The good shepherd always provides more than just the bare necessities. And the reason that you have all the abundant blessings in Christ it's because what your good shepherd did for you in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he prayed that prayer, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, Jesus willingly drank the cup of suffering. He drank the cup of death. He drank the cup of hell. He experienced your judgment and my judgment on himself on that cross so that you and I could have that cup of blessing to save us and the promise that he will supply every need according to his riches and glory. And so God is great and God is good because Jesus saves, Jesus guides, Jesus restores, Jesus comforts, Jesus supplies. But look at the last verse 6. He assures. Jesus assures. He says, surely, that means I assure you. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell. Look at that confidence. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In other words, God's goodness and grace will be with me through my whole life. From the day I get saved to the day I enter into the gates of glory. Now, it's my understanding when you want to read about shepherds that you don't drive sheep like you would do cattle. You lead sheep. And so in the back of the fold of sheep would be, they would be exposed to wolves and thieves. Because the, sh the shepherd would be out front leading. But the good shepherd would always have two sheepdogs in the back. So the good shepherd's out leading. The two sheepdogs are in behind, protecting the sheep from anything that would try to sneak up. But the Bible teaches us Jesus is our great shepherd. And he also provides for us the full armor of God. And when you look at the full armor of God in Ephesians 6, we know that's all frontal armor because we're supposed to be moving forward with Christ. So what happens behind us? Well, every step of the way, as you walk on this earth, behind you, when you're not looking, we know the devil's looking for a way to do a sneak attack. And every time the devil sticks his head up, there's the sheepdog's goodness and mercy following you. When a demon tries to do a sneak attack on a Christian, there's goodness and mercy that the devil nor his demons can match with power. So notice what this promise assures us of. This is not something we earn, not something we deserve. This is something God provides because of his goodness, because of his grace and his mercy. The goodness of God and the mercy of God is always hot on our heels from the day we get saved. All the way to heaven. Notice what the verse says. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that means I'm going to live with God one day forever in that place that he's prepared for me. Jesus talked about that promise. God does really have a big mansion with many, many rooms, as Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I come, I will receive you to myself. The Father's house is heaven. 
It's called paradise. It's the place where Jesus lives and sits at the right hand of the Father, the Father's house. And the only person who has a guarantee that they're going to the Father's house is the person who settled this issue, where you can say with confidence, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. I don't want you to ever be afraid. I don't want you to ever live in fear of anything. And I certainly don't want you to ever feel alone. I don't want you to be ruled by your nerves or emotions because I want you to understand if you know Jesus Christ, you have the good, the great, the chief shepherd in you and the presence of the shepherd in your life is so powerful. I want you to know he's always there even though you can't see him. I want you to know he is always there even though you may can't feel him. He's always there because this is what the word of God says. Jesus is beneath you like the green pastures. He's beside you like the still waters. He's before you like that table with a big banquet of blessings that God wants to bestow upon you. He's above you like that anointing oil. He's behind you like goodness and mercy. And he's beyond you standing at the door of the Father's house with arms wide open waiting for you where you can hear him say, welcome home. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Listen to me close. No one looking around. In just a moment, since we don't have pianists today, I'm going to actually have a CD played for an invitation hymn. But before I pray and ask you to stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed, listen to me. Can you say with 100% confidence that the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal shepherd? If you can't, you can. You're not here by accident today. If you can't say that, listen, all you got to do right there at your pew is understand being a good person can't save you. Church membership can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. You just need to acknowledge, hey, Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I now understand you went to the cross for me. You paid my sin debt. You died for me. You was buried. You rose again. I believe that. And I'm accepting you as my Lord and personal Savior. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. And once you're saved, then you need to be able to make the next step. And the next step is obedience. And that is, first part, is being baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. But it is a testimony that you've been saved. It's a testimony that you desire to be obedient to the Word of God and that you're not ashamed to identify with Jesus. And Jesus said to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if you're here today and you're not sure that you're saved, I'd be glad to help you with that. You don't have to leave here today not knowing for sure. You can know. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to get your name on Land's Book of Life. But if God is leading you to come here, we'd love to have you. But I don't want you to feel obligated with that. You get saved, God will put you where he wants you to be. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand. I'm going to ask you, when you stand, you just keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. And if you need to come forward for a decision today, you come on the very first verse. Father, O oh Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray, Lord, right now that hearts have been tenderized. And Lord, anyone under the sound of my voice that needs to be saved has already called upon your name. And they'll be willing to make it public. For those that you want to follow you in obedience to be baptized, I pray they'll make that public today. For those that maybe, Lord, you want to add to our church, if that's your will, Lord, we want that to happen. All we want is what you want. But for those that just need a fresh touch, those that may just want to say, Lord, I need you to restore my soul. May they feel the liberty and freedom to come to this altar, to stand or kneel and call upon your name. So you just have your way. May every person under the sound of my voice just be obedient to your call and conviction. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.